Tom Jones by Henry Fielding. Book 13, Chapter 10. A chapter which, though short, may draw tears from some eyes. Mr. Jones was just dressed to wait on Lady Bellaston when Mrs. Miller rapped at his door, and being admitted, very earnestly desired his company below stairs to drink tea in the parlour. Upon his entrance into the room, she presently introduced a person to him, saying, This, sir, is my cousin, who hath been so greatly beholden to your goodness, for which he begs to return his sincerest thanks. The man had scarce entered upon that speech which Mrs. Miller had so kindly prefaced, when both Jones and he, looking steadfastly at each other, showed at once the utmost tokens of surprise. The voice of the latter began instantly to falter, and instead of finishing his speech he sunk down into a chair, crying, "'It is so! I am convinced it is so!' "'Bless me! What's the meaning of this?' cries Mrs. Miller. "'You are not ill, I hope, cousin. Some water, a dram this instant!' "'Be not frighted, madam,' cries Jones. "'I have almost as much need of a dram as your cousin.' We are equally surprised at this unexpected meeting. Your cousin is an acquaintance of mine, Mrs. Miller. An acquaintance, cries a man. Oh, heaven. I an acquaintance, repeated Jones, and an honored acquaintance, too, when I do not love and honor the man who dares venture everything to preserve his wife and children from instant destruction, may I have a friend capable of disowning me in adversity. Oh, you are an excellent young man, cries Mrs. Miller. Yes, indeed, poor creature, he hath ventured everything. If he had not had one of the best of constitutions, it must have killed him. Cousin, cried the man, who had now pretty well recovered himself. This is the angel from heaven whom I meant. This is he to whom, before I saw you, I owed the preservation of my Peggy. He it was to whose generosity every comfort, every support which I have procured for her was owing. He is indeed the worthiest, bravest, noblest of all human beings. Oh, cousin, I have obligations to this gentleman of such a nature. Mention nothing of obligations, cries Jones eagerly. Not a word, I insist upon it, not a word. Meaning, I suppose, that he would not have him betray the affair of the robbery to any person. If, by the trifle you have received from me, I have preserved a whole family, sure, pleasure was never bought so cheap. Oh, sir, cries the man, I wish you could this instant see my house. If any person had ever a right to the pleasure you mention, I am convinced it is yourself. My cousin tells me she acquainted you with the distress in which she found us. That, sir, is greatly removed, and chiefly by your goodness. My children have now a bed to lie on, and they have, they have eternal blessings reward you for it. They have bread to eat. My little boy has recovered, my wife is out of danger, and I am happy. All, all owing to you, sir, and to my cousin here, one of the best of women. Indeed, sir, I must see you at my house. Indeed, my wife must see you and thank you. My children, too, must express their gratitude. Indeed, sir, they are not without a sense of their obligation. But what is my feeling when I reflect to whom I owe that they are now capable of expressing their gratitude? Oh, sir, the little hearts which you have warmed had now been cold as ice without your assistance. Here Jones attempted to prevent the poor man from proceeding, but indeed the overflowing of his own heart would of itself have stopped his words. And now Mrs. Miller likewise began to pour forth thanksgivings, as well as in her own name, as in that of her cousin, and concluded with saying, She doubted not, but such goodness would meet with a glorious reward. Jones answered, He had been sufficiently rewarded already. Your cousin's account, madam, said he, hath given me a sensation more pleasing than I have ever known. He must be a wretch who is unmoved at hearing such a story. How transporting, then, must be the thought of having happily acted a part in this scene. If there are men who cannot feel the delight of giving happiness to others, I sincerely pity them, as they are incapable of tasting what is, in my opinion, a greater honor, a higher interest, and a sweeter pleasure than the ambitious, the avaricious, or the voluptuous man can ever obtain. The hour of appointment being now come, Jones was forced to take a hasty leave, but not before he had hardly shaken his friend by the hand, and desired to see him again as soon as possible, promising that he would himself take the first opportunity of visiting him at his own house. He then stepped into his chair, and proceeded to Lady Bellaston's, greatly exulting in the happiness which he had procured to this poor family. Nor could he forbear reflecting, without horror, on the dreadful consequences which must have attended them, had he listened rather to the voice of strict justice than to that of mercy, when he was attacked on the high road. Mrs. Miller sung forth the praises of Jones during the whole evening, 
in which mr anderson while he stayed so passionately accompanied her that he was often on the very point of mentioning the circumstance of the robbery however he luckily recollected himself and avoided an indiscretion which would have been so much the greater as he knew mrs miller to be extremely strict and nice in her principles he was likewise well apprised of the loquacity of this lady and yet such was his gratitude that it had almost got the better of both discretion and shame and made him publish that which would have defamed his own character rather than omit any circumstances which might do the fullest honour to his benefactor End of chapter ten chapter eleven in which the reader will be surprised mr jones was rather earlier than the time appointed and earlier than the lady whose arrival was hindered not only by the distance of the place where she dined but by some other cross accidents very vexatious to one in her situation of mind he was accordingly shown into the drawing-room where he had not been many minutes before the door opened and in came no other than sophia herself who had left the play before the end of the first act for this as we have already said being a new play at which two large parties met the one to damn and the other to applaud a violent uproar and an engagement between the two parties had so terrified our heroine that she was glad to put herself under the protection of a young gentleman who safely conveyed her to her chair as lady bellaston had acquainted her that she should not be at home till late sophia expecting to find no one in the room came hastily in and went directly to a glass which almost fronted her without once looking towards the upper end of the room where the statue of jones now stood motionless in the glass it was after contemplating her own lovely face that she first discovered the said statue when instantly turning about she perceived the reality of the vision upon which she gave a violent scream and scarce preserved herself from fainting till jones was able to move to her and support her in his arms to paint the looks or thoughts of either of these lovers is beyond my power as their sensations from their mutual silence may be judged to have been too big for their own utterance it cannot be supposed that i should be able to express them and the misfortune is that few of my readers have been enough in love to feel by their own hearts what passed at this time in theirs after a short pause jones with faltering accent said i see madam you are surprised surprised answered she oh heavens indeed i am surprised i almost doubt whether you are the person you seem indeed cries he my sophia pardon me madam for this once calling you so i am that very wretched jones whom fortune after so many disappointments hath at last kindly conducted to you oh my sophia did you not know the thousand torments i have suffered in this long fruitless pursuit pursuit of whom said sophia a little recollecting herself and assuming a reserved air can you be so cruel to ask that question cries jones need i say of you of me answered sophia hath mr jones then any such important business with me to some madam cries jones this might seem an important business giving her the pocket-book i hope madam you will find it of the same value as when it was lost sophia took the pocket-book and was going to speak when he interrupted her thus let us not i beseech you lose one of those precious moments which fortune has so kindly sent us oh my sophia i have business of a much superior kind thus on my knees let me ask your pardon my pardon cries she sure sir after what is past you cannot expect after what i have heard i scarce know what i say answered jones by heavens i scarce wish you should pardon me oh my sophia henceforth never cast away a thought on such a wretch as i am if any remembrance of me should ever intrude to give a moment's uneasiness to that tender bosom think of my unworthiness and let the remembrance of what passed at upton blot me for ever from your mind sophia stood trembling all this while her face was whiter than snow and her heart was throbbing through her stays but at the mention of upton a blush arose in her cheeks and her eyes which before she had scarce lifted up were turned upon jones with a glance of disdain he understood this silent reproach and replied to it thus oh my sophia my only love you cannot hate or despise me more for what happened there than i do myself but yet do me the justice to think that my heart was never unfaithful to you that had no share in the folly i was guilty of it was even then unalterably yours 
though i despaired of possessing you nay almost of ever seeing you more i doted still on your charming idea and could seriously love no other woman but if my heart had not been engaged she into whose company i accidentally fell in that accursed place was not an object of serious love believe me my angel i never have seen her from that day to this and never intend or desire to see her again sophia in her heart was very glad to hear this but forcing into her face an air of more coldness than she had yet assumed why said she mr jones do you take the trouble to make a defence where you are not accused if i thought it worth while to accuse you i have a charge of unpardonable nature indeed what is it for heaven's sake answered jones trembling and pale expecting to hear of his amour with lady bellaston oh said she how is it possible can everything noble and everything base be lodged together in the same bosom lady bellaston and the ignominious circumstance of having been kept rose again in his mind and stopped his mouth from any reply could i have expected proceeded sophia such treatment from you nay from any gentleman from any man of honour to have my name traduced in public in inns among the meanest vulgar to have any little favours that my unguarded heart may have too lightly betrayed me to grant boasted of there nay even to hear that you had been forced to fly from my love nothing could equal jones's surprise at these words of sophia but yet not being guilty he was much less embarrassed how to defend himself than if she had touched that tender string at which his conscience had been alarmed by some examination he presently found that her supposing him guilty of so shocking an outrage against his love and her reputation was entirely owing to partridge's talk at the inns before landlords and servants for sophia confessed to him it was from them that she received her intelligence he had no very great difficulty to make her believe that he was entirely innocent of an offence so far into his character but she had a great deal to hinder him from going instantly home and putting partridge to death which he more than once swore he would do this point being cleared up they soon found themselves so well pleased with each other that jones quite forgot he had begun the conversation with conjuring her to give up all thoughts of him and she was in a temper to have given ear to a petition of a very different nature for before they were aware they had both gone so far that he let fall some words that sounded like a proposal of marriage to which she replied that did not her duty to her father forbid her to follow her own inclinations ruin with him would be more welcome to her than the most affluent fortune with another man at the mention of the word ruin he started let drop her hand which he had held for some time and striking his breast with his own cried out oh sophia can i then ruin thee no by heavens no i will never act so base a part dearest sophia whatever it costs me i will renounce you i will give you up i will tear all such hopes from my heart as are inconsistent with your real good my love i will ever retain but it shall be in silence it shall be at a distance from you it shall be in some foreign land from whence no voice no sigh of my despair shall ever reach and disturb your ears and when i am dead he would have gone on but was stopped by a flood of tears which sophia let fall in his bosom upon which he leaned without being able to speak one word he kissed them off which for some moments she allowed him to do without any resistance but then recollecting herself gently withdrew out of his arms and to turn the discourse from a subject too tender and which she found she could not support bethought herself to ask him a question she never had time to put to him before how he came into that room he began to stammer and would in all probability have raised her suspicions by the answer he was going to give when at once the door opened and in came lady bellaston having advanced a few steps and seeing jones and sophia together she suddenly stopped when after a pause of a few moments recollecting herself with admirable presence of mind she said though with sufficient indications of surprise both in voice and countenance i thought miss western you had been at the play though sophia had no opportunity of learning of jones by what means he had discovered her yet as she had not the least suspicion of the real truth or that jones and lady bellaston were acquainted so she was very little confounded and the less as the lady had in all their conversations on the subject entirely taken her side against her father with very little hesitation therefore she went through the whole story of what had happened at the playhouse and the cause of her hasty return the length of this narrative gave lady bellaston an opportunity of rallying her spirits and of considering in what manner to act 
and as the behaviour of Sophia gave her hopes that Jones had not betrayed her, she put on an air of good humour and said, "'I should not have broken so abruptly upon you, Miss Western, if I had known you had company.' Lady Bellaston fixed her eyes on Sophia while she spoke these words, to which that poor young lady, having her face overspread with blushes and confusion, answered in a stammering voice, "'I am sure, madam, I shall always think the honour of your lady's company. I hope, at least,' cries Lady Bellaston, "'I interrupt no business.' "'No, madam,' answered Sophia, "'our business was at an end. "'Your ladyship may be pleased to remember "'I have often mentioned the loss of my pocket-book, "'which this gentleman, having very luckily found, "'was so kind to return to me with the bill in it.' "'Jones, ever since the arrival of Lady Bellaston, "'had been ready to sink with fear. "'He sat kicking his heels, playing with his fingers, "'and looking more like a fool, if it be possible, than a young booby squire when he is first introduced into polite assembly. He began, however, now to recover himself, and taking a hint from the behaviour of Lady Bellaston, who he saw did not intend to claim any acquaintance with him, he resolved as entirely to affect the stranger on his part. He said, Ever since he had the pocket-book in his possession, he had used great diligence in inquiring out the lady whose name was writ in it, but never till that day could be so fortunate to discover her. Sophia had indeed mentioned the loss of her pocket-book to Lady Bellaston, but as Jones, for some reason or other, had never once hinted to her that it was in his possession, she believed not one syllable of what Sophia now said, and wonderfully admired the extreme quickness of the young lady in inventing such an excuse. The reason of Sophia's leaving the playhouse met with no better credit, and though she could not account for the meeting between these two lovers, she was firmly persuaded it was not accidental. With an affected smile, therefore, she said, "'Indeed, Miss Weston, you have had very good luck in recovering your money, not only as it fell into the hands of a gentleman of honour, but as he happened to discover to whom it belonged. I think you would not consent to have it advertised. It was great good fortune, sir, that you found out to whom the note belonged.' "'Oh, madam,' cries Jones, "'it was enclosed in a pocket-book, in which the young lady's name was written.' "'That was very fortunate indeed,' cries the lady. "'and it was no less so that you heard Miss Western was at my house, "'for she is very little known.' "'Jones had at length perfectly recovered his spirits, "'and as he conceived he had now an opportunity of satisfying Sophia "'as to the question she had asked him just before Lady Bellaston came in, "'he proceeded this. "'Why, madam,' answered he, "'it was by the luckiest chance imaginable I made this discovery. "'I was mentioning what I had found.' and the name of the owner the other night to a lady at the masquerade who told me she believed she knew where i might see miss western and if i would come to her house the next morning she would inform me i went according to her appointment but she was not at home nor could i ever meet with her till this morning when she directed me to your ladyship's house i came accordingly and did myself the honour to ask for your ladyship and upon my saying that i had very particular business a servant showed me into this room where I had not been long before the young lady returned from the play. Upon his mentioning the masquerade, he looked very slyly at Lady Bellaston, without any fear of being remarked by Sophia, for she was visibly too much confounded to make any observations. This hint a little alarmed the lady, and she was silent, when Jones, who saw the agitation of Sophia's mind, resolved to take the only method of relieving her, which was by retiring. But before he did this, he said, I believe, madame, it is customary to give some reward on these occasions. I must insist on a very high one for my honesty. It is, madame, no less than the honour of being permitted to pay another visit here. Sir, replied the lady, I make no doubt that you are a gentleman, and my doors are never shut to people of fashion. Jones then, after proper ceremonials, departed, highly to his own satisfaction, and no less to that of Sophia, who was terribly alarmed lest Lady Bellaston should discover what she knew already but too well. Upon the stairs Jones met his old acquaintance, Mrs. Honour, who, notwithstanding all she had said against him, was now so well-bred to behave with great civility. This meeting proved indeed a lucky circumstance, as he communicated to her the house where he lodged, with which Sophia was unacquainted. End of chapter 11 Tom Jones, Book 13, Chapter 12, in which the thirteenth book is concluded. The elegant Lord Shaftesbury somewhere objects to telling too much truth, 
by which it may be fairly inferred that in some cases to lie is not only excusable but commendable and surely there are no persons who may so properly challenge a right to this commendable deviation from truth as a young woman in the affair of love for which they may plead precept education and above all the sanction nay i may say the necessity of custom by which they are restrained not from submitting to the honest impulses of nature for that would be a foolish prohibition but from owning them we are not therefore ashamed to say that our heroine now pursued the dictates of the above-mentioned right honourable philosopher as she was perfectly satisfied then that lady bellaston was ignorant of the person of jones so she determined to keep her in that ignorance though at the expense of a little fibbing jones had not been long gone before lady bellaston cried upon my word a good pretty young fellow i wonder who he is for i don't remember ever to have seen his face before nor i neither madam cries sophia i must say he behaved very handsomely in relation to my note yes and he is a very handsome fellow said the lady don't you think so i did not take much notice of him answered sophia but i thought he seemed rather awkward and ungenteel than otherwise <gasps> you are extremely right cries lady bellaston you may see by his manner that he hath not kept good company nay notwithstanding his returning your note and refusing the reward i almost question whether he is a gentleman i have always observed there is a something in persons well born which others can never acquire i think i will give orders not to be at home to him nay sure madam answered sophia one can't suspect after what he hath done besides if your ladyship observed him there was an elegance in his discourse a delicacy a prettiness of expression that that i confess said lady bellaston the fellow hath words and indeed sophia you must forgive me indeed you must i forgive your ladyship said sophia yes indeed you must answered she laughing for i had a horrible suspicion when i first came into the room i vow you must forgive it but i suspected it was mr jones himself did your ladyship indeed cries sophia blushing and affecting a laugh yes i vow i did answered she i can't imagine what put it into my head forgive the fellow his due he was genteelly dressed which i think dear sophie is not commonly the case with your friend this raillery cries sophia is a little cruel lady bellaston after my promise to your ladyship not at all child said the lady it would have been cruel before but after you have promised me never to marry without your father's consent in which you know is implied your giving up jones sure you can bear a little raillery on a passion which was pardonable enough in a young girl in the country and of which you will tell me you have so entirely got the better what must i think my dear sophie if you cannot bear a little ridicule even on his dress i shall begin to fear you are very far gone indeed and almost question whether you have dealt ingenuously with me indeed madam cries sophia your ladyship mistakes me if you imagine i had any concern on his account on his account answered the lady you must have mistaken me i went no farther than his dress for i would not injure your taste by any other comparison i don't imagine my dear sophie if your mr jones had been such a fellow as this i thought says sophia your ladyship had allowed him to be handsome whom pray cried the lady hastily mr jones answered sophia and immediately recollecting herself mr jones no no i ask your pardon i mean the gentleman who is just now here oh sophie sophie cries the lady this mr jones i am afraid still runs in your head then upon my honour madam said sophia mr jones is as entirely indifferent to me as the gentleman who just now left us upon my honour said lady bellston i believe it forgive me therefore a little innocent raillery but i promise you i will never mention his name any more and now the two ladies separated infinitely more to the delight of sophia than of lady bellaston who would willingly have tormented her rival a little longer had not business of more importance called her away as for sophia her mind was perfectly easy under this first practice of deceit upon which when she retired to her chamber she reflected with the highest uneasiness and conscious shame nor could the peculiar hardship of her situation and the necessity of the case at all reconcile her mind to her conduct for the frame of her mind was too delicate to bear the thought of having been guilty of a falsehood however qualified by circumstances nor did this thought once suffer her to close her eyes during the whole succeeding night end of part thirteen